Seven decades ago, the first television adaptation of Superman arrived. Now, it's time to rock it back to the 1952-1958 series Adventures of Superman, starring George Reeves. In this rewatch podcast, my guests and I break down each episode, from its black-and-white crime drama beginnings to the kid-friendly color seasons, as we celebrate one of the most underrated Man of Steel depictions of all time. Welcome to another exciting episode in The Adventures of Superman. I'm your host, Anthony Desiato. Joining me to discuss Season 1, Episode 12, The Deserted Village, is John Reed's Comics podcast host, John Wilson. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm also happy to have you. One of the great things about doing this podcast and the Digging for Kryptonite podcast is just getting to connect with fellow Superman fans and fellow Superman podcasters. And you know, we were talking off mic, we've interacted on on Twitter a little bit, but this is the first time we've actually had a conversation and I've seen each other face to face, albeit through a computer screen. So uh, it, it's great to, to be able to put a, a face to the voice uh, that I've heard on your show uh, and, and that I've interacted with online. So it's it's great to meet you and it's great to have you here. Yeah, um, it was, it's was it been fun to get back into the adventures of Superman because it I've seen all of them at least once, but it's been a number of years. So this was this was a fun excuse, and the deserted village was—it was a pretty fun episode. All right, I'm I'm curious to compare notes. I feel like we might we might uh, we might diverge a little bit in our feelings towards the episode, but that's okay. That that can be, that can be a good thing. That's totally fine. So the episode we're talking about again, season one, episode twelve, the deserted village, aired on December fifth, nineteen fifty two, written by Ben Freeman and Dick Hamilton, directed by Tommy Carr. My synopsis for the episode, and then of course we'll break everything down more specifically. When Lois cannot reach anyone in her hometown by phone, she and Clark travel to Clifton, a very small village by the sea that has been deserted by all but four people who remain tight-lipped about what's going on. Lois's old nurse, Mrs. Tazy, Dr. Jessup, and the pharmacist and his son. Plus, just who is that mysterious figure in the bizarre hazmat suit <laughs> spraying poisonous gas and throwing bricks in windows? So, 12 episodes in, our next episode, which will come out in two weeks, I think people have been looking forward to this. I know I have. Is the stolen costume one of the oh, most yeah. famous episodes of certainly of the season, but but even of the entire series? So we're very close to that. Of course, that's not what we're here to talk about, but w that's what we're getting to. I've really been looking forward to it midway through the the first season. So uh, we're we're very close for people who've been keeping track. <laughs> uh, but before that. Uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit about your, your history with the show, and that's typically where I like to start when I have a new guest on. And so let me, let me toss it to you. I mean, what, what is your experience with the George Reeves series, and, and what role, if any, has it played in your Superman fandom? So my Superman fandom as a child is very much a background aspect of my life. I, did, I wasn't into Superman. I knew about him. And so the George Reeves show, the Fleischer cartoons, the Super Friends animated, those were all just like things I ran across on TV. Um, I wouldn't say I watched it devotedly, but I knew about it. I knew it was there. I was familiar with the look. I was familiar with the aesthetic. And then um, in 2009, uh, I set out to try to read every Superman comic ever, beginning with Action Comics number one. Now, anybody who has ever started a Try to Read Everything mission knows that most of the time these things don't actually get very far. And I've certainly had other read-through missions that didn't get very far. But I've managed to stick with this one. So um, as I got into the 1950s, of course, I saw the serials, and I saw the Mole Men film, and I watched through every episode of the George Reeves uh, television show. It was just around that time that they'd hit DVD, so they were really easy to get a hold of. They just came out on DVD, um, which... One minor quibble with the DVD release on the color episodes, they the intro and outro, they used the season six intro and outro instead of the actual intro and outro of the episodes that were released at the time. I don't know how much it matters, but the copyright date on that thing says 1956 or seven or whatever. And I'm like, it is not 1956. This is 1952 or three or whatever it was. But anyways, minor quibble aside. So I got to watch all of the George Reeves. I got to see the shift in tone from this first season we're talking about whenever they change Lois Lane actors and then kind of just, you know, change over to more of a comedy show. Um, 
And then, yeah, I've continued to read and watch every Superman comic and every Superman media production. And I'm currently up to early 1993. So he's dead. And after that, there was no more Superman. So that's very sad. I know. It was a real shame. You know, it had such a good run. And then they, just, they canceled uh, all the yeah, comics. I know. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's great to hear. We were talking about that off mic, too, about this this reading project of yours, which I'm, I'm so in awe of and you know I'm contemplating something similar but even even at the outset I'm like I I, I don't know that I would go that far it's <laughs> such an it's such an undertaking though but I'm sure it's very rewarding and to kind of have all of that under your belt because I as someone who has not done all of that reading it's like there's so many things where I'll I'll know right okay they're 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 deriving some inspiration from this you know this silver age story or something and I've read a lot of the key silver age stories but and, and, you know, Golden and Bronze as well. But, you know, there's so, there's a vast amount that I haven't read. And so, you know, I might know where something's kind of coming from, but I don't have the full frame of reference. So, uh, you know, I would imagine it's pretty cool to, to now have that. You do get a feel for the tropes and for the storytelling styles. And there are certainly eras where I enjoy having read it, maybe more than I actually enjoyed reading it, if that makes sense. Like, I, I, I've read these stories. I know what was going on then. I'm not sure that they were exactly a great era for Superman, but now I know. And as a fan, I want to have had that. I want to have that knowledge in my brain. Um, but the era where George Reeves' Superman show was coming out, the 1950s, was actually a pretty low era for comics, uh, in my esteem at least. And so uh, I would say that his show was probably a highlight of the, uh, of the franchise at the time. Now, I'm putting you on the spot, and I know it's been a while since you did that reading project and since you watched the show, but I know, especially as we get into the, you know, seasons two and beyond of Adventures of Superman, that there was this this close coordination between the show and the comics, and there were certain stories that, you know, would be told in, in, in both, you know, uh, mediums. So I was curious, uh, as you were going through your, your process, did you notice, did you notice a lot of that overlap between the show and the comics? And there the were, there were a couple, um, there weren't as many as I think maybe some people have the impression of, I remember a couple, um, uh, great Caesar's ghost, I think is a prime example of one, um, where it was done on the show and then it was done in the comics. I think it was show first. It could be, I mean, I could be mistaken. Um, but Generally speaking, I think that media producers have a lot more, um, a lot more reign to do whatever they're going to do with their show or their film or their movie, and then the comics are just kind of doing their thing. So the comics will adapt shows more often than shows will adapt comics. But certainly, that's not always, you know, absolutely the case. Gotcha. And I guess the last big picture question that I want to ask. So I, I've mentioned this on the show a bunch of times. I've seen all of the black and white episodes, and I've seen about a quarter or more of the color episodes of Adventures of Superman. Obviously, when we get there with the podcast, I'll be watching all of them and talking about them. From what I've seen of the color years, I vastly prefer the first two seasons. I don't necessarily expect my opinion will change as I make my way through, but I was just curious what your overall assessment was of the arc of the series Adventures of Superman, especially that shift to the color years. And is it is, is there more there to enjoy that that maybe I'm, I, I overlooked in, in that limited viewing that I did? There's probably some parallels to be drawn between the shifting of tone of the TV show during its six seasons and the shifting of tone of the comics during their 15 or so years up to that point. Um, I guess we're getting close to 20 years by the time the show wraps. Um, because Superman, you know, was a lot more gung-ho, man of action, takes no prisoners kind of guy in the early years of the comics and he's a bit more like that in the first season of the show there's there's a certain you know determined noir aspect um to superman and after season well they change it lois is in season two and then after season two the show itself starts to change but so does superman comics there's a lot of comedy in superman comics there's a i remember the moment where my daughter she was still pretty young She's 21 now, but she was like early teens. And I was reading a Superman comic and it had um, Lois Lane opening the oven and uh, she was taking out this tray of buns and one had fallen on Superman's foot and he was hopping up and down, holding his foot like it had hurt him. You know, ha ha ha, she overcooked the bread, hard as rock, so hard that it hurt Superman. Um, but you know, that kind of humor cover was typical of the era. And I remember Lily looking at that cover saying, so what is it about this cover that would make me want to read this comic? 
<laughs> she didn't like the humor and she doesn't so much like her humor in Superman. But I think it's important to remember that for a big chunk of his history, Superman was very much a comic book. And there's a lot of comedy to be had. Um, even whenever he was a lot more, you know, um, rough and ready justice guy, he would make the occasional joke at the expense of the people he was beating up. So, you know, it's he's not Peter Parker, but he has some, the occasional quip in those uh, first 20 years. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I'll, I'll, you know, I look, I, one thing that I've learned over the course of doing both of these podcasts is, is to keep an open mind. And so I, I will do that as my as I make my way into the color years. Uh, I, I think there's been a, somewhat of a sense of dread because I've been enjoying these early episodes so much, going mm-hmm. through them again. And uh, but I, it'll it'll be interesting when we get there. But I'll definitely keep all of that in mind uh, when we get there. So yes, the deserted village. Uh, one one initial thing that I want to say is I don't want to forget. So we've mentioned on the show a bunch of times, episode two of season one, the haunted lighthouse where Jimmy Olsen is off on Moose Island and he gets caught up in this uh, smuggling ring and people posing as his family members. And w- what's interesting is that I, I came into this podcast series really pretty down on The Haunted Lighthouse. And then when I rewatched it for the podcast and we had the discussion about it, I really came around on it in a big way. And I came to appreciate the atmosphere uh, that it was able to create. And I thought it was a, a great you know, Jimmy Olsen spotlight. And my opinion on it really, really kind of shifted. I, I don't mean to dump on the deserted village, but I have even greater appreciation now for the haunted lighthouse after watching, <laughs> after rewatching the deserted village. Not that the deserted village was a dud, but I feel like there was some good setup in this episode that we're talking mm-hmm. about. I don't know how satisfying the payoff necessarily was, and right. I think looking at the haunted lighthouse as a whole, I think it really it stuck the landing in a better way, and it it was more cohesive and worked. Uh, from start to finish, whereas the deserted village again, I think great setup, kind of kind of you know petered out in the end. So my opinion of the haunted lighthouse continues to improve. By the time I'm done, <laughs> you know, at, I didn't give you a heads up about this, but I'll tell you now. At the end of the, each episode, we rate we rate the episode, and I have my fedora rating system. So on a scale of one to five fedoras, how much did we enjoy the episode? And I re-listened to the end of the haunted lighthouse episode, and I had given that one a two out of five, and I. I think this is the first time I've done this, but I'm going to amend that earlier rating and I'm going to bump it up to a three uh, because I think I was a little, you know, episode two, but I think I was a little harsh on it. So, uh, and I'll just kind of put that, you know, uh, put that out there for you to let that marinate as far as uh, when we get to the end of this episode, how many fedoras you'd give this one. So uh, that's a long winded way of saying that rewatching the deserted village uh, sort of, again, changed the way I looked at the haunted lighthouse even further, but let me toss it to you. What are your overall impressions of this episode? Did you enjoy it? Did you, you know, did it live up to whatever your memory of it was from the first time you went through it? What was your experience? So part of the joy of rewatching this episode was getting back into Reeves and Coates. Because, man, George Reeves as Clark Kent, Phyllis Coates as Lois Lane, that was a pair. And I'm not sure if there is a Clark and Lois pair I love as much as those two until I'm blanking on her name on Superman and Lois. I know Hecklin is Superman. Oh, yeah. Bitsy Tulloch. Yeah. And, you know, so uh, Tulloch and Hecklin there. Um, I love Cavill as Superman. I love Amy Adams as Lois. I don't love them as a couple. We don't get to see them as much as a couple. Um but just they don't have a whole lot of time just bouncing off of each other as Clark and Lois because we never got the we never got the film of Superman living his normal life from the current slate of or most recent slate of DC films. We got the intro and we got the you know death story, but we never got the day in the life of Superman movie. So I can't really speak to them as a couple as much. Um, but man, so seeing George Reeves, you know, in the fifties. Clark was okay. So he was never as bumbling in the comics as he was in that first 1978 film. That just wasn't a thing, but he was occasionally, you know, would do things that was just a little bit silly. And in the fifties, Lois just didn't have a whole lot of respect for Clark. She was nice to him most of the time, but you didn't really see a whole lot of respect for him. And here, George Reeves, I mean, 
Lois occasionally puts in a put down comment, but it's most of the time they're coworkers and they're fine. And he kind of commands respect when he's in the room. Um, and so does, so does Lois. Coates' Lois is one of the best Loises in the history of the character. So just, but just getting back to that dynamic was one of the joys of the episode for me. Um, you're right, the story itself was probably not as solid, um, but I liked the setup, and I liked the things we got along the way getting into wondering what was going on with everybody being gone. But at the end of the day, it's like the entire village has been evacuated, and everyone is acting like this is just Tuesday and you're supposed to be okay with it and leave. And that's a little bit of a hard pill to swallow as a story consumer. Yes. So I, I agree with you about this version of Lois and Clark. I agree. That has been, from the first time I watched the show to rewatching it now, it's, it's such a highlight. I wish we had more seasons, if not the entire series, with Phyllis Coates as Lois. I, I agree with you. I think she's far and away one of the best, and I love the two of them together. Even though, obviously, this doesn't get into the romantic territory, right, on this series that we'll get in other, mm -hmm. in other iterations. But And this episode, too, I think was a great example of really the two of them working together side by side, trying to figure something out, and it was really cool. And, and even initially, when uh, Lois is on the phone with the operator and she's trying to get a hold of uh, Mrs. Tazy, her old nurse who sends her a gingerbread cookie every year. Uh, she can't get through to her or anyone else in the town. And she's explaining this to Clark. And, you know, he's so quick to say, well, why don't we just take a drive? It's an hour north. Let's go. And she's like, oh, will you come with me? He's like, of course. And just like that quick back and forth and the support of each other, I really felt like they were a unit here for most of the episode. I will say, uh, I, I admired Lois's persistence throughout the episode, right? Because each person that they, there aren't many, but each person they meet in the town, specifically Jessup and, and Mrs. Tazy, uh, you know, they're giving Lois and Clark the runaround, right? Oh, there's nothing going on here. You guys should just leave. And Lois and Clark, of course, know that something is up and they, they won't take no for an answer. They won't just back down and leave. And I feel like, you know, Lois throughout, you know, just keeps, keeps asking, like, what's going on? What's going on? We won't leave. Uh, but it's Clark who's who's figuring out everything, you know. When they when they come upon Doctor Jessup passed out from the from the gas uh, in, in his in his house, you know, Clark goes through the drawer. He finds the gun and the gas mask. When they're talking to Mrs. Tazy in the yard, Clark is the one who sees the gas mask in her flower basket. Clark, oh, they make the one... us, they make really sure that we saw that he saw that. There's yes. like <laughs> at least two close up shots of that thing. Yes. You know, and then he's the one who tells, because Tazy says, I'll come in for tea. And, and you know, Clark is always like, make sure you don't drink any tea. And she's like, why? Just promise me. It's like, <laughs> it's one of those times, where, not to nitpick, but it's like, just explain why. But right. it would be great if she didn't need to have it explained. And I know eventually she makes it to the cave and, and, and makes the discovery that she does, which we'll talk about. So it's not that she has nothing to do, but I just, there was a lot of persistence from Lois. I guess I just would have liked a little bit more of her figuring things out or kind of being in on it with Clark as opposed to Clark mm -hmm. having the answers and withholding it from her and the audience to build the suspense. Right. So, you know, that's one one minor quibble with this. I chalk it up as a lot, I suppose, to, to the times. And I do recognize that, you know, look, Lois in general and on the show was ahead of the times in so many ways. Uh, I think this was a little bit, though, of a, of a, you know, she could kind of only get so far in this episode. Right. But, uh, but I, yeah, I agree. The two of them together, can't ask for much better. And the dynamic of them is Lois and Clark and not necessarily as Lois and Superman because Superman, as a costume, Superman was a very minor part of the story. And it harkens back, you know, because I'm sure you're aware, you've talked about this on the show before, but, like, the TV show is a sequel to the radio show, conceptually. And so in the radio in the radio show, it's always Clark. Superman comes in and does a few fantastic things, but it's majority of the time Clark is being Clark. Um, and this is very much that. George is being a man in a suit with a hat investigating a problem, and he only serves Superman at the end to fix the things that need a little bit of extra action and extra power. Um, I just and that was that's a dynamic of Superman storytelling that I really enjoy. Yeah, I, I've said this a lot, but it, it, it always bears repeating that, you know, constraints make the artist. And I think this is an instance where there's only so much Superman we would be able to see, right, on this show in this time period with the budget and technology that they had available. So it makes sense that they lean more into the Clark side of it, but it's it, it works, right? And I love, like, I just love that we have these kinds of stories, right, that lean so heavily on 
Lois and Clark as investigative reporters. And I'll be honest, there's there. I can't think of any instance thus far where I've said, oh man, I wish there was more Superman action in this episode. Like, I'm mm-hmm. happy. I couldn't be happier, <laughs> you know, watching, watching Clark in action. And to your point, yeah, that's been one of the things that I've loved with this show is how confident, decisive, authoritative, often impatient uh, <laughs> this Clark is. Although... And I've complained about this before too. I want to get let me get your take on this because there are there are certain digs every now and then that Lois will make toward Clark uh, about how how he's not brave, and we get we get a, a second of it in this episode when Clark pulls Lois out of the cave. Right, she's discovered these um, these mining stakes. Right, and Clark figures out what the significance of that is and how it plays into the larger plot of the episode. Uh, and he wants to go get them tested. And, of course, he's going to fly off as Superman to do this quickly. And he has to convince right. her, no, like, I'm faster on my own, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but in this exchange, she makes a, a a comment like, oh, you're my protector, the man who's afraid of a fly. When you hear stuff like that, does that does that line up with what we are seeing no, from this No, nope. I thought the exact same thing. It's like, okay, Lois, whom are you saying this to? Because <laughs> this Clark is not the Clark you're describing. Um and he blows it off. He blows it off with, yeah, whatever, okay? We don't see this Clark doing dumb stuff and showing a you know, cowardly side to himself. I'm not sure if he does a single cowardly thing in the entire six seasons. You know, he'll duck out at inconvenient times. Um, and sometimes, sure, he'll pretend that it's something a little bit embarrassing. But that's, his, I think, as far as it goes. He certainly does not show fear. This Clark has already done a lot of stuff, you know, that other people have seen where he's facing some some strong odds. But, of course, he turns to Superman whenever a regular Clark couldn't take care of the situation. Um, and so I don't know. I felt like that line was out of place. Now, Lois was annoyed that she, as a woman, was being told to just go over there and sit and let the man take care of things, which is very much how that played out. Um, and so maybe she was just, you know, if we wanted to get an in, in-universe in her head kind of explanation, maybe she was just throwing something out there because she was annoyed. But um, beyond that, no, it does not line up with Clark at all. It's just, it, it particularly stands out because like we've said, and this has come up in a lot of our other other episodes so far, this isn't just, this isn't just a Clark who's, more mild-mannered rather than bumbling. This is, like we've been saying, a tough Clark. And so I think it just makes it, it just makes that disconnect all the more prominent when, when you get lines like that from Lois. But and I, I don't want to keep beating up on the show for it, but it's just something I'm sort of tracking as we're making our way through. And, you know, this was a particular instance where it's like, eh, I don't know that we've really seen anything <laughs> in this episode or even generally to really warrant that. I, I like your reading of it. If she's just kind of frustrated with him, and that's kind of like what she's throwing at him, even if it doesn't necessarily uh, have any any basis for it. But right, you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll take it for what it is. Maybe there's let, one particular instance that she's thinking of where he needed to run out on something, and she interpreted that as cowardice, and so she's holding that against him. But it certainly, it's not a general trend for this Clark. Yeah, that's fair to say. And I, in, in fairness, the My Machine episode where they, we have the runaway school bus, she wants to go after the bus and Clark needs to go change into Superman. So he's like, oh, let me go. Because there was a lady passed out in a car, long story short, uh, by the side of the road. He's like, oh, I have to go help this lady. And she took that for cowardice. Like he didn't want to go after the bus. He wanted to just help the lady by the side of the road. Again, I still think a little bit of a stretch. But yeah, there are there is at least one instance, right, that we've seen so far. And maybe we can chalk it up to that where she's uh, sort of uh, ascribing all of this to him based on you know one or two instances. We'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> as, far, as far as uh, oh, I want to do a little little guest star alert here. I actually just talk about the cast generally. So this is one of those episodes. No Perry, no Jimmy, no Inspector Henderson. Mm-hmm. So Lois and Clark are our only regular cast members in this episode, uh, and we have our handful of guest cast. So we have Fred Sherman as Dr. Jessup. Now, we just saw him a couple episodes ago in Rescue. He was a mining inspector, uh, so he's back. Uh, we have uh, Maudie Prickett as uh, Mrs. Tazy. We have Ed Cobb as Peter Godfrey. And uh, perhaps most notably, for me at least, is Malcolm Mealy as Alvin Godfrey, the son of, of the pharmacist. He played. He, he looked like he should have had a much lighter-pitched voice than he had. Just looking at his face, 
I expected, I don't know, I did not expect the baso that we got from that guy. I expected like a high tenor. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. just like he should be talking, I don't know, so much more youngly. I hear you. Well, so what stood out to me about him was we just talked about him because he was in episode 11, No Holds Barred. He was Wayne Winchester, the collegiate wrestling champ that Perry White brings in. Uh, as they're, as the Daily Planet is trying to bring down this uh, crooked wrestling syndicate in Metropolis. Mm -hmm. And he was the wrestling expert. Do you remember that one, No Holds Barred? Vaguely, yeah. It's a great episode. Actually, it's one of my favorites of, of season one. And I know, as we say every episode, the episodes aren't airing in the order in which they were made and, and all of that. It, it's funny to me, though, that we had this guy's two episodes air back to back. Uh, and, you know, right. it's, it's, it is it's is what it is. Uh, but it's just, Kind of Generally, when you're pulling in a guest star multiple times like that, you tend to space those out, like one a season or something like that. But um, having multiple in one season and then having them air back to back—that's that's amusing. Did um, did Maudie Prickett give you Margaret Hamilton vibes, like Mrs. Gulch kind of thing? Oh the, yeah, uh, from the Freemix we can of Wizard of Oz. I mean, not as mean, obviously, but just kind of like if that woman were in her element or playing, you know, were a nicer person. I don't know. I started thinking about whatever she was talking. Because she sounds like Margaret Hamilton doing Mrs. Gulch's voice. And I was like, that doesn't look like her. Is that her? And that was, of course, it's not her. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I could kind of see that. I looked her up on IMDb. She did like a few episodes of Andy Griffith show. I mean, she did a bunch of mm -hmm. stuff. But you know, interestingly, with Malcolm Mealy, and I think this came up last time, he only has three credits to his name. He did an episode of another show. He did two episodes of this. And... I think was like uncredited in one movie. That was it. So I don't know what, what became of him, what, what he ended up doing, but uh, the acting was, was short lived, but you know, uh, only three projects he was a part of. And that includes two episodes of, of adventures of Superman as two different characters. So, uh, you know, that's our, our cast that we're working with here. I, I think one of the things that I bumped up against with this episode and not to overthink it, not to nitpick, but it was kind of hard to buy that Jessup and Taisy would not accept the help of Lois and Clark. That they, A, that they would stay, right? So the entire town has has deserted, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Has deserted Clifton. There's this this poisonous gas that's uh, that, that's permeating the city. And when we open on it, and it's, again, I mean, very atmospheric. And you see this, you know, haze kind of engulfing the, the town. And again, this, this mysterious figure in the hazmat suit walking through, spraying the gas, throwing bricks and windows to let the gas in. I think the initial setup, like it does give you a, a good sense of foreboding and mystery. It's like, what is going on here? What happened to all of these people? But yeah, I, I guess I kind of I hit a little bit of a wall in those two characters in particular, their refusal to to leave, but then more so to not accept any help. I, I just it was kind of I, I don't know that that really tracked for me. Did, did you have any issues with that or did, did that kind of make sense? No. Like I said earlier, the fact that this is a deserted village and yet these, you know, less than a half dozen people are still there for no apparent reason. And with no asking for help and no one else is there. And also two people show up and they're just like trying to play it off like this is normal. All of that felt really strange. So really, what I said earlier, I really liked this episode. It was the feeling of watching the show. The episode itself has some questions. <laughs> why are you here? Why are they terrorized? And why are you just okay with it? You know, so many things. It's like, okay. I don't know exactly why this is even happening. Lois should have gone there and found nobody. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and that's the thing that I can totally appreciate that. Like you haven't watched the show in a long time and you're just back in the world and you're with these, these favorite versions of the character. I, I totally get it. Again, my perspective is different because, you know, I'm going through each episode and watching it and studying it and dissecting it on these episodes. So it's like, <laughs> I, I guess I'm less, maybe a little less generous in, in certain respects, but uh, yeah, I, I will say, and it, one thing that I really did like, I, I wish there were more of it, but I did like that you at least got some sense of Lois's history, right? Where she comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, you they don't do a lot with it. Backstories of those characters, and usually whenever they do, it's like to say something special that ties them back into Superman somehow. Like the time that Lois made a school field trip to Smallville for a Superboy story, or the time that Robin went back in time and met Superboy, so he knew early Superman, or, uh, 
how did young Perry White and young Clark Kent meet for the first? So you get those kinds of of background, but you don't normally get characters just regular background. Um, would you like to hear another random tidbit about Lois Lane? Go for it. So in the uh, Sunday newspaper strips, there's a story where Lois Lane goes to meet her um, her uncle, whose name is Bill Bigsby. <laughs> Who, for listeners who don't know, is also the guy who played the Incredible Hulk in the 1970s TV show. So Lois Lane's uncle is the Incredible Hulk. And I just, if, if you weren't aware, that's a crossover connection between universes that you can take home with you. There you go. Look at that. So educational here on this podcast. Right? That is fun. That's really cool. I, yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't know that. I, you know, I mention this one all the time, but in the Crime Wave episode at the end of season one, that's largely a, a you know a clip show, right, that, re, that utilizes footage from past episodes. Uh, but crafts a new narrative out of it. Uh, we get via uh, narration this tidbit that Perry White in Adventures of Superman had been the mayor of Metropolis, which I love. I don't think anything has ever been done with that otherwise that I'm aware no. of. But in any other continuity, no, he's always come up as a newspaper man. So he was a mayor. Did he just like take time off from the Daily Planet to do that? Or is that something he did and then moved over to run the Daily Planet? Nobody knows. I think we just probably gave it more thought than they did. <laughs> it was because honestly, and I'm excited to get to that episode at the end of season one. But it's just kind of like this throwaway thing in the voiceover where it's just our narrator is telling us Perry White, who used to be mayor of Metropolis, calls a press conference. It's like what? <laughs> but it, I, you know, I just I love it because it just you know Perry and the Daily Planet they occupy such this such a place of prominence right in the show and not that you need his background as a mayor to account for that you don't but it just adds like i feel like it gives perry a little bit more weight right and and mm -hmm. he is so authoritative and barking orders and you know he's always kind of at the center of things and it's like oh okay well this makes even more sense now if he used to be the guy who ran the city so i'll go with that so and we have this idea that lois grew up in clifton i don't know that that has ever been mentioned before or since uh, to my memory of Lois, she's always grown up in Metropolis. You know, her father was military. So if she was, well, her father's not military in this incarnation. That doesn't happen until the 80s. Her father was a farmer in the comics, I believe. So um, she could have very easily lived somewhere else besides Metropolis before she lived in Metropolis. But is it Clifton? I don't know. Um, yeah, Lois's parents were farmers and Lana's, parent, Lana's dad was an archaeologist. And Lana's uncle is Professor Potter. That's a whole other thing. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. We got this this fact that she comes from Clifton. Again, very small. Population 525. Uh, so very, very small. Three. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we have, you know, we have our, our hazmat figure, you know, crossing off numbers from, <laughs> from the, the population sign. Uh, again, great, great start to the episode. Great start to the episode. We have... Uh, you know, a scene in the Daily Planet where Lois is on the phone, I mentioned before, and she's talking to the operator. You know, this goes on for quite a bit because she has this conversation with the operator. Uh, it's like, I'm trying, the lines aren't down, people just aren't answering. And then Clark comes in and has essentially the same questions that the operator did. <laughs> and we sort of get the same information uh, re repeated again. And, and then they're kind of off and they get there. And I, I What I like wanna... about that sequence is that Clark asks the reasonable questions to make sure all bases are covered but not in a way that doubts Lois's worry. And once the bases are, are covered, the, the, the normal things are explained, it's like, okay, let's go, let's go find out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I like that too. That was, again, I, the, the two of them in that, in that office scene in particular, I, I really dug that. You know, when they get to Clifton and they actually make their way into the town, one of the first things they see, and we saw this as it happened uh, in a scene, uh, in a previous scene, a dead dog. This was a this was a rough one. Could have yeah. done without that. I could have done without that. Yeah. It succumbs to the, the the poisonous gas. My girlfriend and I are kind of dog shopping right now. We're we're gonna be getting a house soon, and we're looking for a dog. And you know, seeing a dead dog is never never fun. No, yeah, that was a little bit rough. Again, I, I, I could have done without that. And, of course, then we have the scenes that we've spoken about before where they encounter Dr. Jessup and then uh, Mrs. Tazy. And, and, again, their efforts to sort of throw Lois and Clark off the scent here. Um, was there anything with these exchanges, these scenes, that we, we didn't touch on that, that you wanted to hit? No, it's all pretty straightforward. Um, 
you know, they, they lay the clues, they make sure. And of course it's important to remember that this show is aimed at a younger viewing audience, not in a Sesame street way, but just in a, they're going to make sure that the story indicators are very plain to see. So um, the fact that Dr. Jetson was like, no, don't talk about that. You know, that sort of thing a couple of times. And I wasn't even sure it was a gas mask the first time we looked into our basket. I was like, is that a gun? What are we looking at here? So seeing it the second time, I was like, oh, that's a gas mask. Are you my mommy? Okay. Um, but but yeah, beyond that, it just it just kind of flowed. Yeah, for sure. I you know, going back to what I was saying before, where you know it was cool to get some some insight into where Lois comes from. I'm probably asking for too much, but it's like, I, yeah, it would have been cool to get any more insight into her, into her background. Like, there's no mention of her family, is, is her family, you know, it's like, this is where she's from. Does she have if any If you're going to bring up her town, then why do I, like, I say stuff about her? Exa yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, it's funny, because in um, a couple episodes ago, Rescue, that's the one where there was the mine cave-in, and mm -hmm. there was this... What I thought was a very reasonable, well thought out uh, rescue operation that the miners were putting together, and Lois disregarded that and went in despite all of their uh, <laughs> all of their safety recommendations, and she ended up getting stuck in there as well with the other guy who, who was in there. Uh, and I remember saying in that episode, it was you know it felt like there was a disconnect there where it was kind of hard to account for why Lois was so gung ho and so confident that she knew better than the professionals in that in that instance. And, you know, we chalk it up to she's a go-getter, blah, blah, blah. But I just felt like it would have been cool to sort of have any kind of greater reason. And at, in that episode, I was like, you know, it would have been interesting if maybe she came from a mining town and she had some sort of background, some sort of knowledge, insight, something that would help account for that. So I kind of look at these two episodes. And I'll be honest, Rescue was another one that really kind of fell flat for me. And I feel like maybe there's some version of these two episodes together that actually mm -hmm. would have been... Uh, much stronger as one. Yeah. I, I, the more I think and talk about it, I kind of feel like there's a way to sort of weave these two together and it's a much better. Like the strengths of both and, and yeah, put into one. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, we leave, Clark leaves her with, uh, leaves Lois with, with Mrs. Tazy not to drink any tea, but to try to get some answers. And then Clark goes off and he's investigating. He sees footprints right by where the dog was. The dog's body is now gone. Uh, and then this is where he encounters Godfrey, uh, elder and, and, and junior, uh, and, you know, they're very friendly. We get, uh, you know, of course, it, it's it's all, you know, we, we know it turns out to be uh, just a, a ruse. But Godfrey explains people left because the oyster beds died. So it's this, you know, seaside village. And I guess that's where they, uh, you know, that's sort of the lifeblood of the town. And so there's at least an explanation put forth for, for what's happened here. Mm -hmm. For whatever that's worth. And... I don't know if it was just the way it was shot, but I did not get any particular indication that those footprints were abnormally sized. They don't just like, you know, left huge footprints. And I was like, okay, so is this person in the suit supposed to be larger than average human? Because we're not seeing him next to any humans. He's just doing his thing. But I don't know. It looks kind of normal size to me, but with no reference, maybe they're shooting him. I don't know. So that seemed odd. Because um, if it's just the young guy in a hazmat suit, then why were the boots footprints overly big? They shouldn't have been. They should have just been like, you know, large feet, but normal large feet. I, I agree. I think the way they were describing it's like these these monstrous feet, like what kind of creature do they belong to? It's like, oh yeah, I don't know. I don't think that, that totally that totally lined up. But you yeah, come but in and there's like a split screen with like, you know, Clark is here and the big old guy's here. Like, oh no, what am I going to do? It changes Superman and flies and it hits him. They didn't do any of that because they were the same size guy. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know for sure. I think that 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 kind of, uh, that, that flagged that as well. I'm glad you mentioned that. And yes, like you said, we'll learn right at the, at the, in the climax of our episode that it's the uh, the younger Godfrey who is the, this figure in the hazmat suit. Um, not... I mean, as far as twists go, I guess, actually, let me let me pose that to you. And I know, obviously, we've seen these before, but I'll be honest, I did not remember this specifically. I didn't remember exactly mm -hmm. what the reveal Same. was going to be. Um, and that's the thing. In the in the episode's defense, as I'm watching it, that opening scene, with the, this, this hazy, you know, this hazy fog and the hazmat figure, 
and you know everyone most of the town gone and a couple of people giving them the runaround it's like what is going on it did i was i was intrigued for mm -hmm. for a point in this episode um, it's a good as, setup it's a good setup i mean how as far as the the mystery of it goes or or the reveal that it that it was you know one of the four people in the town and not a mysterious fifth person uh, I, you know as far as the effectiveness of that mystery and reveal had how how effective do you think it was so Do you remember the trope in the Superman comics in like 87, 88 to have like the last page of the comic be a gigantic exposition page of why the story happened? Yeah. I kind of feel like that's what we got. Like there's nothing in the story to make you think any of this stuff except for the masks. The masks make you think gas, but you don't have a reason to know why. Well, also the hazmat suits make you think gas. But you don't have any reason to know why or who or what the motivation is. And it's all dumped on you at the end that the caves have this rare mineral, really huge deposits of it. And so they're killing everyone to try to get. It doesn't really work, but it's what you got. So what you, what you got to do. That is, a. I think that's a good analogy. And that is very much the way this episode feels right because there are others where you know we're not quite sure what's going on but then you know there's a better payoff or there's something some reveal that sort of you know helps illuminate what we've seen previously but in a more satisfying way and i agree here it's just sort of like they kind of plop the explanation on you and it's like okay you know i mean it makes enough sense but in my adhd sometimes i miss details as i'm watching so help me remember um were the what's the character's name the the man in Son, the, the God, Godfrey. Godfrey. Were the Godfreys killing everyone in the town? Or were they just like trying to get them to leave? Were so did did Tazy and Jessup have like their days were numbered, how long they were gonna survive this situation? So that's a good question. I think it's kind of it's kind of ambiguous. We were never given a death toll per se. I think I think it is kind of an open question. How many people left versus how many people died? Because the I, dog died. The dog, yeah, the dog did die. Of course, so the dog I, was so close to the ground, and that's that's a problem with being close to the ground. Yeah, can't get close to the that's ground. Where, that's where the fog is. Yeah, in this deserted village. Well, you know, the poison is heavy, so you know, <laughs> if you're close to the ground, it'll get you. But if you're not close to the ground, then why are you, why is it an effective means of getting rid of the population? I think if you're if you're uh, high enough above the ground, it just knock you out. If you're too close to the ground, you're dead. But this does this does beg the question, and this was the other big thing that I really I really had a hard time with. That I feel like was it just didn't it just didn't track for me. Where so the Godfreys, right? They discover this deposit of hydrocyte, right, which is used in a mineral used in the creation of hydrogen bombs, and it's worth millions, right? So mm -hmm. again, place sort of placing the show in its context, right, in the fifties. It's like oh yeah, that makes sense, right. I guess, but. Uh, I guess the question I had was why did everyone have, like, why do they have to get rid of everyone in order to extract this? I mean, I, I guess it, it is such a small town, it would attract too much attention. I guess I, I guess I can buy that, but it just feels like such extreme lengths to go to. I don't know. Did, like, did that make sense to you that in order for them to do this, like, this town, they have to get rid of everybody one way or the other? So... It does seem like a long way to go. So I'm thinking, okay, they're going to start mining this hydrocyte and selling it and making millions. And if this were 20 or 30 or more years later, um, there'd be a lot more of like a communication infrastructure to like, you know, be able to wonder and ask and have a reasonable exp expectation of being documented where this stuff came from. But I do feel like in 1950s rural America, you can just say, I found a cave. And they'll be like, wow, lucky you, you found a cave. And that's all you need. So they just didn't want anybody in the way of their their money expectations. But it does seem like a long way to go. If no one else is going to that cave, couldn't they just, well, I guess people do find, have a way of finding out about things and they wanted their privacy. Yeah, it's fine. Like, uh, out of all the things in the episode, I guess I can kind of get on board with that. But to your going back to your question, 
Yeah, I don't know. I if I had to guess, I would say that some people died. I feel like they I feel like these guys started gassing the town. And I feel like there were probably some people who died and then most of everyone else fled. Right? Like I don't think they I don't think they massacred over 500 people. I I hope not. Uh, but yeah, we don't know. But I, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I feel like there were some casualties, but I think the casualties then precipitated the desertion of the town. Well, the problem is, if we want to get macabre about this, the problem is is that um, dogs aren't the only things that are close to the ground that can die. Um, small children. So if you have uh, mysterious fogs rolling in and your children are dying, that might be a reason to get out of town. But it might also be a reason to like call authorities. But then you go back to the fact that this is nineteen fifties rural America, and there just might not be that many authorities to call. I don't know. Right. Yeah. I, I, again, I, where where I still where I have to draw the line is is with the two who stayed with with Jessup mm-hmm. and Tazy. It's like why okay, are you still here? Why are you still here? And then why? I I just wish there was some reason given for why they were so resistant to that. Like I don't want to belabor the point, but I these I really I really kind of had a hard time with this in the episode. It's it's the biggest thing with the episode. You're here, you don't want help, and you want to pretend this is normal. Whenever people do show up, that shouldn't wash. That doesn't really go together. You know, it, as we're as we're talking it through, I, like I feel like it, this would have made more sense if they were just all in on it, like the four who were there, right? Mm-hmm. It's like we're mining this dangerous mineral that we're gonna, I don't know, sell to a foreign power to make a bomb. We scared everyone out of town, and why are you here? Yeah, yeah, I feel like that would have made vastly more sense. Probably, but then you wouldn't have had Lois Lois's sympathetic, like you know, person from the past part of her life. To connect to so i think their hook into the episode ended up interfering with the explanation of the episode those two things didn't really work well together yes i think you hit the nail on the head i, I agree I, I think you know like just as you know we like this whole angle that oh this is where she's from she has a connection to someone but then i agree i think that works against the episode and undermines the logic that we, we would need it to have I, I will say one of my favorite moments in the entire episode and going back to just seeing george reeves as clark when he's talking to Godfrey and then they hear gunshots and he runs back to Tazy's house and he runs and he jumps over. I mean, it's not a super high fence, but like he runs and jumps over the fence and it's like, man, like this was him in his prime. Like I love seeing him move like that as Clark. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. And that's a Clark scene too. That's a Superman scene. Uh, I remember the, the first Superman scene. He, uh, it's like, was someone looking at him through a lens and he's running toward the camera and he looks like he's going to fly and instead of flying, he dives off a cliff or something like that. It's it's a little bit humorous. Yes. Because I know exactly. Like he, yeah. When he jumps toward the camera, he's going up, but then we get a rear shot, he's going back down. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking. I had the same thought to him. The guy's gonna fly. Oh no, he's just jumping down. Well, it's weird too, because he searches as Superman, but then he, he changes back to Clark, right? When he finds Lois in the cave. And yeah, you know, she made her way to the caves. I don't know, maybe this was something I missed from just forgetting or blanking, but like why she knew to go to the caves. If Maybe the hazmat guy had been spotted there or something like that. I don't remember that either. Um, I do feel like they were just trying to get scenes of Superman into the show because he hadn't really been in it much. And here we are at like, you know, the end of the second act and there's no Superman yet. So having him show up there was probably a good thing. Yes. Uh, kind of on the note of positives and Superman, the Superman action, I did like the final showdown in the cave, right? Because, of course, Lois goes back back in after after Clark tells her to wait. Uh, and then Hazmat Guy, you know, knocks her out, and he's, you know, going to put her in a tarp and <laughs> loading it with rocks like she's done for. And then Jessup and Tazy show up to help, and we have the, the whole, uh, you know, altercation, and then Superman intervenes. And, again, you see that physicality. Like, I thought, I thought that that final uh, action sequence was solid. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a satisfying Superman scene. And I like... You know, the black and white helps it not look as bad as a color shot would look, but scenes of him flying, the zoom ups on his face, everything, those are really, really nice. As the show goes on, they're going to go to so many stock shots of him flying that since they're still making new shots of Clark in the air, Superman in the air, it's nice to see. Right on. I know, before we give our rating, is there anything else about the episode itself that we didn't touch on that you wanted to discuss? Um, 
just the very tail end when you have the sort of the Lois and Superman, everything, you know, sort of like, you know, putting the button on the ending, um, you know, Superman's just there and he's smiling, you know, and he's, he's talking to everyone. Like he's one of the guys. I kind of wish there was a bit more awe in the other people that this is Superman. It's just like, it's a good thing Superman showed up. Oh, here's Superman. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And even Lois, like you said earlier, they don't really play up the romance very much in this era, which for Coates' portrayal, I kind of like um, that they keep away from that for the most part. But, you know, she's like, I've got to go take care of Clark. And he's like, oh, Clark's fine. She's like, okay, bye, Superman. And, you know, it's just it's just fine. Um, but this is still early in his career, and I would just kind of wish there was a bit more shock and awe at Superman. Maybe they can only, maybe they thought that at that point, era of tv storytelling they needed to be in a standard way of doing things every episode like they things ever progressed in 50s tv it was just one way you have your intro and then you have your status quo so it's probably just that's the way things were but i did like the ending with all of them and um i don't know seeing lois and superman there it made me smile no, that's always cool. Your point is well taken, though. That's one of the other things I've been tracking in these season one episodes is, uh, you know, like the common person's reaction response to seeing Superman. And it's been a mix. There have been instances where people have been like, who are you? <laughs> and other times where they are kind of like dumbfounded when they see him. I, I feel like especially in this instance where we're dealing with like such a small town. It's like we're not in Metropolis and this is someone on the street. Right. Literally, I didn't see Superman all the time. Yeah, I feel like there probably could have been a little bit more more awe, but at the same time, I mean, these people, I think, were just so <laughs> they've been through so much uh, in their deserted village. I think they, you know, maybe they didn't have there was nothing left in the tank for them at that point. I don't know. Right. I guess we're at the point where we rate the episode. So, on a scale of one to five fedoras, how many would you give the deserted village? So, I came into the episode feeling like this was a good three. You know, it wasn't. Um, super amazing it wasn't anything bad as we've talked about i've been realizing some more of the holes that it had i'm gonna have to take it down to a two um and those two stars stand on the merits of seeing george reeves and phyllis coates performing their way through this episode more than the actual episode itself um that's i enjoyed watching it but as a story, as an actual script, it probably does have some problems and just, you know, have to own up to those. I, I agree. And I'm also going to give it a two. And again, keeping in mind, I've now upgraded the Haunted Lighthouse from a two to a three. So this one, this one gets a two. This is, uh, for me, this has definitely been one of the weaker ones in this first half of the season. As I always say, again, it's not been often where we've, you know, been as negative towards an episode but whenever that happens, as I always say, for anyone who loves this episode, whether there are strengths that you see that we don't, or maybe you just have a fond memory of watching this as a kid, right? And it's, it's just a favorite of yours. Like, awesome. I never want to take away from that. And I, it's like, John, I feel so bad. It's like you came in. You're like, oh, it's a great episode. Now after talking about it, oh, it's not that good. Uh, so I, I feel bad because that's never the goal. But, you know, again, for anyone who loves this one, right on. I'm glad you do. I wish... I saw what you did, and who knows? Maybe I'll watch this for a third time at some point, and and I'll find something to latch on to. But yeah, this one just was not working for me. I'm of a similar mindset. I love to hear when people love things that I did not enjoy as much. Because uh, on a couple of fronts, maybe I can find out what you liked about it more. That'll increase my appreciation. And also that means that the creative efforts of actual human beings who create art went appreciated by people. I just wasn't one of them. I could not, I could not agree more, right? I, I, I think, I think we're similarly aligned, similarly aligned, right? It's like if we don't like something, it's not that every, no one else can like it. It's like good. I hope other people do like it. I hope some, I like you said, like I hope that art, this episode, is enjoyed, you know, by by others out there, even if it's not us necessarily mm -hmm. to the same extent. So next time we have the stolen costume, I'll be joined once again by Thirteenth Dimension Editor-in-Chief Dan Greenfield, who was on the show before. We talked about the monkey mystery. That was a fun one. Uh, and he'll be back for the stolen costume. And uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the radio show version of that story. There were a couple. There's one in particular I plan to listen to uh, and discuss when we get there. So that's a big one. I, I, hopefully people will be interested and, and excited about that one. Uh, but, John, for people who want to uh, follow you and, and uh, check out your podcast, where do you want to direct people? 
So, um, as I said at the beginning of the show, I have been on a mission to read all of the Superman comics ever. So, as I was approaching Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is, of course, has a huge milestone, not for DC in general alone, but for Superman in particular, uh, I wanted to find some way to commemorate it. So, I ended up doing a podcast where I talk about uh, every issue of Crisis on Infinite Earths and all of the Superman comics that were published alongside them. So every week, it's whatever Superman comics were released on that date back in 1985, 1986. And as we're here in February of 23, we're on the back end of this journey. Uh, crisis is over, and Superman is in that six-month time period where um, things are different, but things haven't really changed as much as they're going to. Um, and, you know, the stories aren't always great, but it's just kind of I enjoy exploring the period. And so that is called Superman in Crisis. It is all your favorite podcatcher. My website, johnreadscomics.com, has that podcast with all the other ones I produced earlier in my decade plus of podcasting years. And uh, so go check that out, johnreadscomics.com. There is no H in John. You can also follow me on Twitter at John Reads Comics. Awesome. I hope that everyone will will check that out. I, I really do. Like I said, I admire the the commitment to, to reading everything and to and to discussing everything so methodically. It's funny because when you know when I cover certain areas on, on digging for kryptonite in particular, it's like you know we'll cover you know huge chunks like we we'll do like 20, 30 issues, right? Kind of looking at the overall you know the mm -hmm. overall stories and themes and, and dynamics of the time, but really you know going issue by issue, which I can appreciate doing an, an episodic rewatch podcast. It's just like a different it's a different dynamic, it's a different flavor, and there's you know advantages to, to all of those approaches. But, but I just appreciate the you know the patience and the commitment that it takes to to having that more methodical approach. So right on. And especially during the pre-crisis era, I feel like overarching, looking at eras, it lends itself well to that because you can talk about styles and tropes and that sort of thing. Um, and then after you get you know, post-crisis, talking about narrative becomes more of a player um, as, as far as, you know, just the kind of things you can talk about. So it's it, it works well from both angles. Um, but yeah, I did... I did um, you know, more detailed looks at the Golden Age, at the early New 52 years, at... Um, you know, this end of the crisis. I guess for Superman, those are the three eras that I've hit. But I've done other characters too. Anyways, it's all out there. Right on. Well, once again, thank you, John. Thank you, audience. I always appreciate it. Uh, make sure you come back in two weeks for the stolen costume. Adventures await. This show is part of the Flat Squirrel Podcast Network, home to Digging for Kryptonite, another exciting episode in the Adventures of Superman, Summoning the Zords, and My Comic Shop History, available wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review today. Sign up at patreon.com slash anthonydesiato for additional content. Thank you all.